Well, tensions are still running high across Taiwan Strait. The KMT has proposed two bills asking the island's authorities to request U.S. assistance in resisting the CPC and resume the so-called diplomatic ties with the U.S. Well, the move is widely believed to be to checkmating the ruling DPP and put Tsai Ing-wen in a difficult position. And still, regardless of the intention, such separatist moves would not be tolerated by the mainland. How will the cross-strait ties evolve in the next months? And what is the stake for both sides? And how will the U.S. go in terms of its Taiwan relations as it tries to contain China? For more on these issues, I'm joined by Dr. Zhao Hai, fellow research, uh, research fellow from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Professor Zheng Yongping from Taipei University, and Professor Michael T. Clare from Hampshire College. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yuan. Uh, for starters, let me start with you, uh, Professor Zheng. Uh, wh what do you make of KMT's latest proposal for Taiwan Island to resume diplomatic ties with the U.S.? Isn't the case that the KMT was more friendly towards the mainland? How did it come up with such a proposal? Well, we have to know that KMT suffered several consecutive electoral losses in the past couple of years. And they are losing ground continually. And that's why the elites or the leadership in KMT's headquarter, they have become extremely, extremely anxious. And in that anxiety, they cooked up this idea. They figure since DPP and Tsai Ing-wen's administration is going forward to pursue Taiwan independence, thus creating more tensions across the Taiwan Strait. They don't want to become the brake pad that serves to stop DPP. They would rather, in their mind, to propose these two resolutions so that they could challenge the DPP to see if they're there to go for the real Taiwan independence objective. And in their minds, they figure that this would tear down their, their uh, hypocritical mask and th uh, thereby mocking the DPP. However, most observers in Taiwan would agree that this actually backfired because instead of putting on a political theater, you try to put on a show that actually hurt yourself. First of all, this not only represents a very fundamental shift in the policy platform of, of DPP, it also means that it has antagonized many of its traditional hardcore supporters for, for, the, for the KMT. And KMT, in doing so, also antagonized uh, Beijing and many friends in mainland China mm -hmm. and the United States administration does not necessarily appreciate what, DP, uh, what, what the KMT is doing. So I would have to say that this is politically very unwise that, to propose those two resolutions. And uh, Dr. Jahai, uh, do you think uh, the proposal from KMT has antagonized Beijing as we understand that Beijing is more willing to cooperate with KMT uh, when uh, cross-strait relations is concerned? Will that change that? I think so. I think uh, KMT is shooting its own feet and uh, also because they're trying to, as previously stated, uh, because of the electoral loss, they wanted to come back uh, from some way to try to win back some portion of the Taiwan local people and they think this is probably the best way to address their current weakness. And remember, their financing has been cut by the DPP and now they're very, in a very difficult situation. And at this point, they are saying that uh, U.S.-China relations is getting more tense. Uh, so right now, they don't think that uh, having a good relationship with the mainland will help them uh, on the island. Therefore, I think choosing this path uh, is probably their current calculation. However, uh, also I agree, I think in the long run, uh, using this kind of tactic will not only antagonize its own base, but also will antagonize China, making Chinese mainland even further uh, away from trying to cooperate with uh, 
uh, the KMT trying to stabilize the cross-strait relationship. And right now, this tension is very high across the strait. And without KMT playing the role as a counterbalance to the DPP, uh, it is even more dangerous uh, at this point uh, to thinking, you know, because the, the politics will turn further away, uh, making it more dangerous. That, that, that there's a possibility that there will be a war across the strait. And Mr. Clare, how is this idea received uh, in Washington? Do Americans think of this proposal as a serious uh, overture? Well, you know, we're in the middle of a political campaign right now. We're getting closer to our election. So the truth of the matter is uh, that uh, this has not been widely discussed in the United States. Uh, so. Uh, you know, there, you, you just can't say that, that the American people are, are aware of what the KMT has done. And I think we would find it surprising, given the KMT's historical role uh, with its ties to the mainland. So we would find it surprising. And moreover, the Trump administration has gone out of its way in recent months to show its support for President Tsai. Uh, so all, all around, this seems a, a very surprising move on the KMT's part. I, I don't know that it wins them any friends. But uh, it is uh, the idea, or at least the wish, from many Taiwan politicians. Uh, recently, Joseph Wu said Taiwan and the U.S should further strengthen their economic relations, trade relations, political relations, and even security relations. So how will U.S. respond to this kind of request, and where does it end? Well, certainly there are very strong uh, interests in the Trump administration to build closer ties with Taiwan, and they have been uh, cultivating the TPP uh, regime very closely by sending high-level figures there and through arms sales, which I hope we, we could discuss further. So there, there is a very strong sense in Washington within the Trump administration in particular that um, the U.S. wants to support greater moves towards independence on the part of Taiwan. But this is not out of any particular, I, I would say not out of any particular concern about Taiwan itself. It is part of a larger move mm. to uh, mobilize against mainland China as part of a larger anti-China stance that the administration has taken, which is evident not just in Taiwan, but in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So, um, you know, Taiwan is part of a larger, a larger picture. Mm. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in, in uh, Tokyo this week uh, trying to build what they call the Quad, this relationship of Australia, Japan, and India as a anti-China coalition. So I think you have to see Taiwan in that relationship. So, Professor Zheng, uh, do Taiwan authorities still understand that probably Taiwan is just a piece of the puzzle? The only reason that the U.S. has been sending high-level officials and selling arms is because they believe it is an important leverage against uh, mainland China. Well, in, in terms of the geopolitics uh, strategy, I think uh, Tsai Ing-wen's administration, the DPP administration, is willing to bet on the United States. In their minds, they figure that U.S.-China relationship has gone sour. It will not return to what it was in the 90s. So they figure that the United States is going to back Taiwan no matter what. So they're pushing forward where they, with their goal toward the Taiwan independence, the secessionist goal. Uh, well, at the same time, they are going for widespread propaganda inside Taiwan, informing or brainwashing Taiwanese people that don't worry about mainland China's reaction. We do whatever we have to do because the United States is always behind us. We are at the peak 
of a, a relationship, a friendship with the United States at this moment. And this also means that Tsai Ing-wen is willing to spend more money procuring, mm. buying American weapons, whether it's outdated or it's overpriced. And we see just in the past few days that Tsai Ing-wen government announced that they are going to have a 10% increase in military spending. And this is getting ridiculous because we also have needs in social welfare, education, research, and many other areas of public expenditure. But we are squeezing dollars after dollars just to buy some outdated or inappropriate American weapons just to satisfy DPP's appetite for pursuing a Taiwan independence. People here are concerned. Uh, citizens may not be happy with PLA fighters or, or bombers flying around Taiwan or into Taiwan's ADIZ. However, people are also concerned with the prospect for maintaining or pursuing peace and, pro and, and security and stability uh, in the Taiwan Straits area. So I have to say that Tsai Ing-wen is walking the tightrope. This is not safe because you cannot count on Donald Trump or Mike Pompeo. These people are not that reliable. And history has told us that counting on the United States government is going to make you suffer in the end. Just look at many other instances in history. United States is really not a very reliable partner. Uh, about the mainland's response, uh, Dr. Zhao, uh, as uh, Professor Zheng just mentioned, Tsai Ing-wen is trying to increase the budget and encourage more young people to join the military service. What is the mainland's uh, assessment of the military capabilities of Taiwan, and does it change its strategy because of that? Well, I think um, everybody knows it's quite clear that after uh, 40 years of opening up and reform, China's uh, overall economic uh, strength is much bigger and the size is much bigger and also accordingly China's uh, military strength is growing dramatically even though the overall military expenditure is still under 1.5 percent of GDP. So comparing China's uh, military strength to Taiwan is uh, inappropriate b because it's disproportional. China's military is probably 10 times bigger right now than Taiwan's. So whenever if we go to uh, that point of military confrontation, then I don't think Taiwan alone can resist uh, uh, the mainland's uh, any military action. However, I don't think this, at this point this, this is the issue, because unless China has been forced to, I mean mainland is forced to take action, uh, I think mainland China will not try to uh, change the status quo or trying to uh, pressure the uh, Taiwan side. Because right now, what the Taiwan government, I mean the Tsai Ing-wen government is trying to do, is to use this situation. Of course, uh, they have very little room to maneuver because the U.S. is giving them a lot of pressure. And uh, people sitting in the White House, in the uh, State Department, and also in Pentagon, are thinking that uh, they can play this either way. It's a win-win situation for them because when they provoke mainland, China will definitely respond and they can point fingers in China and say, see, these people are aggressive. And if China does not respond, they will escalate the situation and try to provoke China more. So from their position, they, they're thinking this is probably a win-win situation for them. However, from China's perspective, this cannot continue. And we're, we have sent warning signs to uh, uh, Taiwan uh, region and also to the United States that this is a very dangerous game to play, and they should stop right now. Yes, as you said, probably military uh, force is the last resort. But the problem is, are we approaching uh, that line because much of the mainland society uh, seem to be losing patience regarding to uh, the island issue. Voices of unification by force is on the rise in the mainland social media platforms. So will that change Beijing's calculus, Dr. Zhao? Um, I don't think so. Yes, at this point there are social media um, and there's a lot of propaganda within uh, Taiwan trying to push people thinking that this is not going to happen. And uh, on the mainland, you can see that social media is spreading a lot of the news about uh, the situation you know, getting worse and worse. However, I think the decision maker in Beijing is very clear-minded, uh, very uh, clear-minded, and they're thinking that you know, unless they cross the red line, uh, I mean, mainland China will not tend to use military action, to mili use military force. We still want peaceful 
reunification, and this is the ultimate goal. And one country, two system is the, what we are trying to pursue here. So all along, I think this is very important uh, message sending to the other side that unless they de-escalate and soon, uh, that China will be forced to take action. And because a more and more um, uh, popular demand for this kind of action, um, Beijing's choice is uh, getting smaller, uh, even though I think uh, the leader will clearly mm. make the right decision at the end. Uh, so, Mr. Clare, uh, uh, this question probably uh, is in the mind of a lot of people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Will there be a military confrontation, and what will the U.S. do? Will the United States Armed Forces come to the defense of Taiwan? So, you never can be sure, uh, you know, and that's come up in an earlier conversation here. You don't know whether the United States will respond or not. The signals that are being given is that the U.S. will respond because uh, we see that with uh, very um, conspicuous military exercises that have been conducted in recent months in the areas around Taiwan, very large U.S. naval maneuvers and the um, what they call freedom of navigation operations, PRONOPS by the U.S. Navy in the Taiwan Strait, repeated uh, passages by U.S. destroyers. These are all signals that the U.S. will intervene in the case of uh, Chinese military action against Taiwan. But you can never be sure of what will happen. Uh, I would say that the U.S. military, uh, the military itself is planning more for a war in the South China Sea right now. That's, that's the focus of the Pentagon's attention, not Taiwan. So um, I, 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 I would say this, this, there could never be any certainty. Mm. I think if there were a crisis over Taiwan, this could instantly raise to the level of nuclear war. And I think if it, when it came to that point, Americans would get very frightened. As you said, the strategic ambiguity has always been the policy of uh, uh, the U.S. administration. But it seems there is some debate whether they should change that into clarity so that because of, in the context of worsening relations between China and the U.S. That's certainly true. And I think there are forces in the United States that would like to eliminate the ambiguity and make it clear that the U.S. will come to Taiwan's defense. Uh, but the consequences of that, everybody understands that a encounter between the U.S. and China would not be a minor uh, episode, a, a minor event. It would be a major clash between two superpowers and could raise the stakes, like I say, to the nuclear level. Mm. So, I, 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 you know, I think there'd be a lot of thinking about that. And, and Professor Zhang, how do the mainstream of Taiwan people think about the possibility of U.S. troops coming to, to aid uh, in Taiwan if there is a military confrontation happening? Well, there, there, has been, uh, there, there have been several opinion polls and surveys conducted in recent weeks. First of all, we're looking at about 60% uh, of the Taiwanese respondents uh, thinking that the United States Army or, or Navy, American forces will come to Taiwan's aid if there is an invasion from outside. Secondly, the same percentage, around the same percentage, 60% or so of the Taiwanese respondents in the survey indicated that they don't think there is going to be any military conflict in the Taiwan Straits. And most of them are still living their daily life as usual. Nobody's worried about it, even though on the internet there have been uh, discussions here and there. But overall, the atmosphere is pretty much relaxed. But we have to say that. We noticed that in, in the mainstream Western media, for example, The Economist, this week they came up with this uh, argument. They're asking, what is the vital question for the United States? That is, will, would the United States, would the Americans be willing to shoulder all the cost? And The Economist has argued 
that defending Taiwan has become more costly and more deadly. And they did a lot of statistical uh, comparison. I don't want to get into that. But the end result is that they question, the economist, this distinguished international journal, question United States determination to get involved in a Taiwan Strait military confrontation. I would agree that the situation is pretty tense. Mm. But wh whether the American government is willing to protect a Taiwanese administration pursuing Taiwan independence, separation from mainland China, I think that is highly questionable. And I don't think Donald Trump or Mike Pompeo or Robert O'Brien is willing to go that far. And remind you that Robert uh, O'Brien, the National Security Advisor, just a few days ago gave a speech at University of uh, uh, Nevada in Las Vegas and he suggested Taiwan should become a porcupine or become a hedgehog, hedgehog. and that kind of asymmetric uh, capability it should be built up by Taiwanese itself. So the in message is words, that Taiwan is on your own. That the United States may not come to Taiwan's aid. So the yeah, message you're on your own. You're on your own. That's so, a very clear but, message. But Mr. Clare, Trump has been sending uh, mixed messages. On the other hand, is pushing the sale of uh, large packages of weapons to Taiwan, even long-range missiles. That seems to be bolstering up the military capabilities of Taiwan. Uh, how far will Trump administration go? Well, you know, this is a combination of forces behind this. Uh, President Trump uh, talks about arms sales as a form of a boost for the U.S. economy. So you never know exactly what's on his mind. So, so it's a business, it's is not a, a military support. Yeah, well, I'm saying that there are a combination of motives. Part of it is economic benefit to the U.S., but also, uh, as we just heard, there is a sense in, in the Trump administration that Taiwan should do more for its own self-defense and should pay for it. So that, that's been a common feature of the Trump administration. He wants South Korea to do more for its own defense and so on, NATO to do more for its own self-defense. So that's another feature. But I think behind all of this is this growing sense in Washington that China is the rising threat to the United States overall, and Taiwan is part of the larger picture, along with South Korea and India and others, of building up this alliance of states to uh, contain China's rise. And supplying arms to Taiwan is part of that larger picture. I think that's the way it's seen in Washington. And Dr. Zhao, uh, if there is a separatist leader in office in Taiwan and the oppos opposition is also proposing to have a closer tie with Washington, how should the mainland government respond and, and win the hearts and minds of the people there? Well, I, I, th I think I want to make one thing clear. Uh, the, this argument about whether or not Washington will come out uh, from uh, ambiguity to clarity, uh, from the Chinese perspective, it doesn't matter because the only thing matters here is whether or not the Taiwan, uh, I mean, the, the regional governments, whether or not they would go, uh, you know, uh, real uh, official, declare official independence. And they will violate China's uh, anti secession law. And once that law is uh, violated and China, uh, mainland China would absolutely take action because this is uh, regulated, I mean, ordered by law. And at that point, even if there's uh, U.S. intervention, uh, no matter what form, it, it will not matter to China's decision because um, China will definitely finish the job of reunif reunification. Uh, the only difference is that before that, at this point, if uh, the Taiwan government is willing to maintain uh, status quo and they're ultimately you know, willing to um, even, even though they may not recognize uh, 92 consensus, they may negotiate with China to come up with, uh, you know, with mainland to come up with another replacement consensus uh, to recognize one China principle. And then that, that things will be fine. The U.S. can continue probably at some point uh, selling weapons uh, and uh, play uh, a deterrence force in the region. How however, I think once they cross the line, the red line, uh, no matter what they're talking about, it, it, does, it doesn't matter to Beijing. 
Uh, the other thing is that when we talk about winning the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people, it's absolutely crucial that uh, at this point we're in a pandemic and people should focus on the public health, uh, as the Professor Chung has emphasized. Uh, the Taiwan government shouldn't spend money to buy, to purchase weapons from the United States. They should actually consolidate their uh, welfare system and their you know, universal health care. And same thing for China. China's, mainland China is trying to, uh, you know, have uh, free trade with uh, Taiwan, establish more people-to-people -people relationship. And at the end of the day, when the Taiwanese people see through what the uh, Taiwan government and what current Trump administration is trying to do, hopefully they will realize that uh, what uh, mainland's policy all along, I mean, all those, uh, you know, beneficial policies to the business, to the students from Taiwan, uh, is the best for the Taiwanese people, for the people across the street. Uh, I have one minute left, Professor Zheng. Uh, do you think Taiwan can really economically decouple from mainland of China and what that will mean for Taiwan? Well, let's be honest uh, and face the reality. Taiwan is getting a trade surplus of over 30 billion U.S. dollars a year. These are these mainland China market. Now, it doesn't make any sense for Taiwan to make Ch mainland China an enemy. And if you want to get, in, get into a military confrontation or you want to get into an arms race against mainland China, this is totally irrational. And many people here are concerned with their daily livelihood. People in Taiwan would rather Tsai Ing-wen promote their daily benefits, daily livelihood, instead right. of pursuing more and more okay. weapons, because those weapons are not productive I'll, for I Taiwan. Have, I as have a whole. to leave it there. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhang. Thank you, Dr. Zhao, and thank you, Mr. Clare. And that would do it for this edition of Dialogue on CGTN. Goodbye.